Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? So yes, welcome to my talk on uh, in and outside of trading. It sounds a little weird and confusing. Hopefully, you will understand as we go along. Before I get started, let's do the, uh, the obligatory who am I. So my name is Robert Len. I work as a security analyst for Telspace Systems in Johannesburg. I am originally from Cape Town. Perhaps my hairstyle and beard give it away. Um, things I'm into, I love all things hacking. I love retro video games, and I love beating the system. And it's that last point that really brings me onto this topic. So before I start, there are a couple text-heavy slides. I will speak through them. Um, and particularly, this topic itself is not incredibly technical. It's more conceptual and creative. It's more like taking something we do as security analysts and applying it to another industry. So to pay homage to the Shower Thoughts subreddit, this is a thought by me one day in the shower. Try not to picture that. As security professionals, our mindset, the way we work, we're, we're really always looking out for anomalies. We're trying to spot outliers. We're looking for weaknesses. So why can't we apply that to the stocks? Why should all these guys in Ferraris and have all that you know, sort of fancy, nice stuff, why can't we do it as a security analyst? Surely our minds are trained for that. So what's the point of it all? I mean, quite simply, to beat the system and to make some money. Um, most definitely, maybe spending some of Telspace's money investing in some random stocks, I don't know. So I'm just going to go do a little bit of a brief talk about some stock market fundamentals. I'm not going to bore you with it, hopefully not, and I'm no expert at it myself, but these are just a couple of things that are relevant to the topic. So you get something short selling, going short on a stock. It basically means you're betting on it going down. You borrow these stocks from your broker, you believe that they're going to be, that the price is going to drop. So you borrow them from him with that hope and then you buy them when the price goes down as you hoped and you make some money. The more that price goes down, the more money you make. The opposite of that is going long, taking a long position. That is something that's pretty generic. You buy a stock and you hope it's going to go up and when it does, you sell it and make a profit. So the big question is, what influences these prices? That's all you really need to know is, is the stock going to go up or is it going to go down? Because if you know that, you can go long or you can go short and you can make money off it. So the main things that influence stock prices, and there are lots and I do not know all of them, but quarterly result announcements, which happen by law for listed companies, and big events, uh, a merger, a horrible PR nightmare, a product launch, any of these can spike a price or dip a price. So knowing these in advance, that's the idea, knowing something like this is going to happen, if you know this price is going to go up or go down, you can definitely make some money off it. So these are some illegal stock manipulation methods, and these will end you up in jail, and it will not be as good as it is in Orange is the New Black. So a good example is Sony. Quite a few years ago, Sony had a massive DDoS attack. Uh, I think 77 million users were compromised and subsequently locked out. And because of that, their share price tumbled 6% due to this outage. Another example is the Bank of America. So this one was a politically motivated hack, or DDoS. And it took Bank of America's site out for about 24 hours, and the share price dropped 1% of its value in one day, which is a lot. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange had a similar sort of DDoS. This one was really clever. It wasn't actually the Hong Kong Stock Exchange itself. It was their news site where other stocks would announce their results. So on this particular day, that site was taken down, and seven massive stocks, such as HSBC and Cathay Pacific, could not release results, and as such, couldn't trade for the rest of the day. Major losses incurred, and no one really knows what the real point of it was. Now, spear phishing, I mean, I certainly don't need to preach to the choir here about the dangers of spear phishing, but taking a different look at it, spear phishing can really be useful in terms of trading and manipulating a stock. So the basic how-to would be you spear fish your CEO or CFO, you hopefully get access to those emails, you read those emails, and you understand what the company position is. And instead of going further and trying to actually compromise his machine or hack them, you just read his emails, and you just get an idea of what's going on, 
and then you trade on that stock. That is insider trading and you will go to jail for it, but it's, it can easily be done. Now in terms of some of these big, big phishing scams, um, one of them was, a w, was known as the W-2 phishing scam. The W-2 is a, a tax form requirement in the US. And this year alone, over 70 US companies were hit by this W-2 phishing scam. So the whole modus operandi of it was the CEO or some other CFO sends an email to his HR and says, right, I need everybody's tax W-2 forms immediately, and they send them on. Now, the thing is, with these, these W-2 forms, you can actually then take it and claim from tax and get rebates and get money for it, some other poor people's tax rebates. And it was really, really successful. But the thing is, if a company, once a word of a phishing scam gets out, it's never good for companies. Stocks get affected by that, just like they do for DDoS attacks. And particularly tech companies. When tech companies get compromised or phished, it affects them badly. So Seagate is a really good example of what happened with a W-2 phishing scam. They got their whole 2015, all ex-employees, current employees, all of their details were compromised. And their stock dropped 3.5% the day that the new scam broke. So if you're thinking about it, if you're a fisher, you've got a double vector here for making money. Because you know the stock is going to plummet after, you release the, after the, the news of it gets out. And you know that you can use this information you've captured to get rebates. So there's a two-pronged attack here. But these, these are illegal, and these will get you in a lot of trouble. But there are legal ways to do it. So I know Jordan Belfort is probably the not the best poster boy for legal trading, but he definitely is for making a lot of money. And there are guys out there making a lot of money, and it's all about this information. It's all about getting an idea. Is the stock going to go up? Is the stock going to go down? And there's a lot of really, really smart companies out there that are doing things to get this information. So as we spoke about, things like quarterly results, mergers, press releases, these little hints, once you know what's going on with these, all you need is an indicator, and you can make a lot of cash. So looking at some of these companies that provide this data, there's, uh, there's quite a few. Um, before I get into it, I must just thank one of the researchers, Nick Kabrilovich, and the Wall Street Journal for releasing some of this data and reporting on some of these companies. It's really interesting and really relevant to this talk. So Genscape, these guys are amazing. They are, you, you don't speak to them for under six figures. They are super smart. They've got satellites. They've got artificial intelligence. And they've got choppers with infrared cameras. <laughs> choppers with infrared cameras. So what do they do with these choppers with infrared cameras? They fly over Cushing, Oklahoma, which is where 80 to 90% of the U.S.'s oil supply goes through. And the U.S. consumes a lot of oil, 12 million barrels of oil a day. So these choppers with infrared cameras fly over the storage tanks every single day, and they take storage levels. And with that information, they are able to gauge what the EIA will announce. The EIA is the American Energy Agency that announces oil supplies every week. So by being able to check the levels of oil, they kind of know what the demand and the supply is, and with that, they can work out where the price is going. And then they sell these reports to their clients, their clients trade on it, and they make huge cash. Another cool example, what UBS Investment did, Investment Research, they hired a company called Remote Sensing Metrics. Now these guys are a, a satellite imagery analytics firm, and what they did was they took photos of Walmart's parking lot, about 100 of them, a sample size, and every single day they would take photos of Walmart's parking lot and count the cars, quite simply. And over a amount of time, they could kind of work out with their mathematical regression whether or not there were more cars or less cars, and more cars equals more sales. And from that, they had a report, and the report was 100% right. Sales were going up. The stock was going up. They sold that report to their clients, and they made money. Last year saw an E. coli outbreak at Chipotle, a U.S.-Mexican chain. Now, obviously, when your restaurant, when E. coli gets traced back to your restaurant, <laughs> it's not a good thing. Your share price is not going to go up. It's definitely going to go down. But the question is, would it recover? And a company called Second Measure partnered with an anonymous bank and took a whole lot of credit card data, sanitized credit card data, so they said. 
And this data, what they could see with this data was that E. coli, uh, e. coli sorry, Chipotle was definitely not recovering. They could see from the credit card sales that it was not recovering, definitely not. In fact, it was plummeting. I know this graph is a little horrible, but basically at this point in time, that's when the E. coli outbreak happened, it continues to plummet. There was no recovery. So they knew to tell their clients to continue to short the share. But not only that, they could see where Chipotle's clients were now going. So once again, they had the two-pronged attack. By the report, we'll tell you keep shorting, and we'll tell you which guys to now go long on. So that's all good and well if you have six figures to spend on a report, which I don't. So how do we do it ourselves? How do we take the information out there and apply it to any sort of company or any sort of stock? How, how do we get it without going to jail or without spending a whole lot of money? So as MacGyver would do it, and he would blow up a tank with a avocado and ice pick, and <laughs> you've got to use what you have. That's it. We've got we to somehow use what we have. And, and there is a lot of information out there. We don't realize it. And a lot of it, in particular, is stuff we deal with every day. I mean, if we look at the pen testing methodology, it's nothing, it's nothing new, it's nothing fancy, it's nothing dif too different. But maybe our focus here is, is wrong. I mean, for us, discovery is just part of the process that gets us to the gold mine of exploit. But maybe the discovery phase is actually where all the good information is. Maybe that information is, is far more valuable. And certainly in, in finance and in stock, it is. It is more valuable. It's just a matter of how you use it. So this information that we collect day in, day out, we're scanning, we're probing, we're searching all over the internet, maybe this information can be used in another way. And it definitely can. There we go. So before I get started on some of the ways I've been looking at doing this, I'm going to talk about some methods used by others. So Foursquare, I'm sure we're all aware of it. Um, social media, checking in and all of that. The API has been used and abused for years by fund managers. These guys have been loving this. Essentially, you just check in all your, take all the check-in data, have a look at which retailers are getting more check-ins, Getting more check-ins, truly they're getting more customers. Stock's probably going up. Most of the time they were probably right. Uh, Foursquare realized this and has since raised their price on their API usage massively. Um, yeah, as they should. Another way is sites with auto-incrementing user IDs. I mean, you could register a new user every week, every month. With that, track how many users have registered over the last week or month, and then compare that with the expected results and see if it's up or down. I know this was effectively used when Adobe shifted their model to the cloud-based system using the Creative Cloud. They, they had auto-incrementing IDs, and people were able to trade on it. They had an idea. They knew that Adobe had actually beaten their forecasts, and based on that, they went long on the share, and they made a lot of money. So now looking at some of the research that I've done over the past year or so, So it's, it's not really too easy. It, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but the skills involved are actually pretty simple. It's stuff as security analysts that you do day in, day out. It's nothing really different. It's just applying it in a different way. So one of the ways is Google Trends, which we'll go through. Another way is reverse who is. And another option is DNS enumeration. So Google Trends is nothing new. People have been trading on it for a long time, and successfully for a long time. Having a look at just a pretty simple graph here will show you iPhone searches over the last three releases. So iPhone 5, and this is for the search term Apple iPhone. iPhone 5 had some good search, a lot of searching going on. iPhone 6, pretty good. iPhone 7 dropped down a little bit. So you've got to wonder, I mean, do, lack of, do less searches mean less purchases? They do. And if you'd looked at this graph and done this research at the time, you would have seen that a month later, the report, six weeks later when Apple released the report, iPhone sales had dropped. So simply looking at a Google Trends for a product can give you a pretty good indication that if search terms are down, buying is often down. And yeah, Apple shares dropped 2.6% 2, 2 on the news of the iPhone sales decreasing. Looking at reverse who is, 
it's something pretty innocuous, something I'm sure a lot of us do day to day on, on, on systems analysis and network analysis. You want to basically see all the domains associated with a particular registrant's details. You know, if you're looking at a network, you want to see exactly what other sites they've got registered. Perhaps it's a way in. It's very useful. And often new products, if you're launching a new product, you're going to need a new domain name for it. You can't take one that's already been taken. So there are online services where you can continually monitor and check registrant details. I've got a certain email address. I want to see what this guy has registered. You can pay for an API service monthly. It's really not expensive based on some of the money you can make. And you can continually check thousands of websites what new domains they're registering. So I thought this is an interesting way. I'm going to have a look at this. I'm going to find a site or a few where I can track, I can see what they're up to, and I can make some investment choices. So I looked at the NASDAQ, and the NASDAQ is a very interesting place. There's over 3,000 companies listed there. But I particularly focused on the ones that sell a lot of products, a lot of new merchandise, a lot of items that require new domain names. And so I came across a really interesting one that I hadn't heard of called Coty. So Coty is one of the world's leading beauty companies with $9 billion in revenue and over 77 brands. And what I didn't know also is that Coty represent Katy Perry. Katy Perry's perfume is published, well, at least released via Coty. And Katy Perry sells a lot of perfume. <laughs> so looking at Coty and all their domains, I picked up that Katy Perry Mad Love had been registered. And as a Coty follower, I'd noticed for quite a few years that they'd released all of Katy Perry's perfumes, and all of them had domain names. And Katy Perry Mad Love was released at the end of March 2016. So if you can't make money off this, you can at least impress your girlfriend. You can predict Katy Perry's new perfume name. <laughs> so I made a note of this, and I set all my Google alerts and all my reminders, and I actively started looking for Katy Perry Mad Love, and there was nothing. I couldn't find anything. And eventually, the social media campaign launched. I got note of it straight away, that Katy Perry's Mad Love was launching, send in your selfies, and Cody's shares spiked on this news because Katy Perry sells a lot of perfume. So I knew I had some sort of idea here that maybe, maybe this can work. I'd never in my life thought I'd be interested in when Katy's new perfume was going to be released, but I found myself looking for it. Then I, looking through the news and looking through everything, I came across Nintendo. And I saw that Nintendo launched a new game for iPhone, Super Mario Run, and their shares spiked 18% that day. 18% is a lot. I was like, damn it, how did I miss this one, man? If you would have spotted this one coming, man, that's a, that's a meal ticket, man. Because Nintendo are interesting. Their share prices fluctuate often and massively. They're, they're a very interesting company to watch. So how, I mean, I wasn't tracking Nintendo, but I thought if I was, would I have seen this coming? Would I have been able to say, damn it, they've registered this, this new domain name, it's something big, I'm going to buy the shares and I'm going to make a whole lot of money off it. So Super Mario Run is coming in December, and I looked at the domain name, and it was registered the day it was launched. So it could be a coincidence, or it could be that some of the companies out there are a little smarter and realize releasing things like this can cause leaks and can cause people to have an idea on what they're doing and where their share price is going. So it's not all international, it's not all overseas companies. I did some local looking as well on the JSC. And I had a look at Old Spur. Spur are a really interesting company as well. Very successful, really good share. And they make some really good acquisitions. They bought Rockamamas, they bought Husa Grill, some smart investments. And they don't have a lot of domain names, so they're not difficult to track. And you know when something pops up on the Spur that it's big. And at the end of last year, Spur registered Casa Bella Pizzeria. Now, I'd never heard of Casa Bella Pizzeria. Nobody else did, because it was their new branch, their new venture, a high-end pizza restaurant. And when they made the announcement, share prices increased. You would have made some money on that. Well, I would have if I wasn't just tracking it and actually investing. <laughs> but uh, that's next. So the final way that I thought maybe I can make some money off this is far more time consuming, but definitely worth it. It's about DNS enumeration, something I'm sure we're all very familiar with. So the NASDAQ is a massive, scary place. There are yeah, 3,155 companies. I've looked at a lot of them. 
Of those, 449 are categorized as technology companies. So I wonder how many of those technology companies allow DNS zone transfers? Quite a few. And I'm not going to go into any details here because this is a little borderline. If someone can inform me, I don't know what the legalities are of zone transfers, but I don't really want to mess with it. And so you're going to have to trust me on this one. So imagine if one of the companies <laughs> listed as a technology company that allowed zone transfers was an online software provider or was any sort of online service. And you can zone transfer them. So then you can conceivably zone transfer every week, every month, and have a look at all the servers they're adding. And if you can see those servers they're adding, you can get an idea of how many new customers they're getting. And if those servers are, I mean, gift wrapped for you and sequentially numbered or named, <laughs> then it's amazing. And sometimes, if you're lucky, some of them will even correlate to internal DNS records. So now you know exactly what's going on. And you know exactly how quick it's happening. So you do this over a couple of months or over a year, and you line these up with quarterly results announcements. So I know in the first quarter announcement, this company did not too bad, and I could see exactly how many new servers they added. Next time, I can track again how many new servers, how much more money, how much more you know, better announcements have they made. And this particular company had a really good last quarter, really good. The stocks jumped 6% on the news of this, Lots of new subscribers, lots of new business. And I knew this, I saw this coming. And that is exactly where the price increased. Saw it happening. So they're definitely finding, it's all about finding this company. It's all about finding the ones that you can track. So to wrap it all up, there's no guaranteed method on any sort of trading, otherwise we'd all be millionaires. And the same goes for OSIN trading. It's all about indicators. It's all about finding the right company. It's all about finding the one that you can track, the one you get used to, and finding their timings and how they work. It doesn't apply to all clients. Most definitely not. Some are smarter than others. But it's about picking your one and tracking it. And that is my story. Mm.